I'm Charlotte Louise from Clengy.com, and today I'm going to be going over two-dimensional momentum um, and looking at explosions in particular. So basically when you're dealing with momentum, you're going to look at both collisions and explosions. Um, explosions almost exclusively will be when you're looking at two dimensions. Collisions, you can have either a linear collision or sometimes when you're looking at things like a pool ball bouncing off of something, you'll look at more angles. Um, but explosions, because you have things going off, um, this tends to be a pretty common case of something happening. So um, the important thing is not only do we have momentum being conserved, but we have momentum in the different directions being conserved. So we know both of these equations are true. And in this case, when we're looking at some of uh, why, um, in this case, when we're looking at something in the coordinate system, we have Initially, it's just going in the x direction, and then it sort of splits off. So I'm just going to keep all of these things as variables throughout this problem um, so that you can see what you would need to plug in and just make it easier. Um, and we're going to have it initially going at some d, and then we're going to call, so this one will be a di, and we're going to call this Vf1, and we'll call this one Vf2 for our two final velocities. Um, so the important thing here is that in the x direction, our initial momentum, which is mv, is going to be m times vi. Initially in the y, we don't have any velocity that's in the y direction. So this is going to be equal to zero, and that's really the key to this problem. Um, so then we also know that we can split both of these velocities into their components. So we're going to have some x and some y component for both of these two. So we can call this one that x and that y, and we're going to use um, trigonometry to split those two up, and that's going to be helpful to doing x and y directions. And pretty much any time you're dealing with x and y, you're going to start splitting things up into vector components. Um, so here in the y direction, let's try and split that up. Okay, here in the y direction, we have each of these two. So we're going to have the first m has, and that's going to be times v one sine of 30 to get this component right here. And then we have, so we're using just our normal sign convention, which says that is positive which means that we, the other half is going to be negative Vf2, and that's going to be times sine of 60. And here, I would use this equation first because we have this zero, which makes things easy, and then we basically can move this one over to the other side of the equation, and we end up with m halves Vf2 sine 60 equals m half v at 1 sine of 30. And right away, we can get vf1 in terms of vf2. At, in this particular case, these two are going to cancel, but sometimes you'll have a different sort of percentage of the mass that's going up, so that's not always true. But now we can get just that Vf2 equals Vf1 times sine 30 divided by sine 60. And already, because most likely these are going to be the two things that we're looking for in a problem like this, we already have the two of them related. So then we just need one other equation with the two, and we can get, um, get our answer. 
So I'm actually going to bring this equation down here just so we have more room to write. Um, and so we have that initially in the x direction, we have m times di. And then finally, both of these have x components. So we're going to have to write out each of them. Um, and they're actually both in the positive direction, too. We're just calling this way along the x positive. And that's just our normal sign convention again. So m halves times v f1 cosine 30 plus Hopefully that was all really understandable for you guys, and yeah.